It's really um, my pleasure, and I'll tell you why. <clears throat> After I left the university two decades ago to go off on my own, you know, one of the things that happens is your networks get kind of thin, and you <laughs> spend a lot of time kind of on your own. And so, um, uh, and I, you know, even though it's kind of nice to be away from the academic environment, and I won't go into that, but it was kind of nice, but, you know, you kind of miss, so, I was, became an academic refugee, and I got taken in by the Center for Transitional Justice. And I'm telling you, it's been a gift, and I am deeply appreciative. And the, and the interesting thing was where, my, where the work that I was interested in doing took me, this became, to me, more and more the topic that is one of the most pressing ones in contemporary international politics. I think I've... I've fallen into a good camp, and I really, and so I'm very grateful myself. I'm very grateful, and I'm very happy to be able to share some of the. I, mean, I just finished a book uh, called *The Court's Disorder*, uh, and I'm going to tell a little, a little bit of background about the book. Um, but before I do, let, let me begin by, um, in deference to my legal academic colleagues, I want to none of them are here, but there you are. But uh, I want to start with putting it in the context of a particular feature of the Rome Statute. Which, you know, when you read the, the, the Rome Statute on a first pass or a third pass, just you go through. Um, and this article doesn't appear, doesn't jump off the page, but um, <clears throat> as I began to study this first trial, it became more and more important. If you read the first lines, first lines, you realize now what the thing is doing is saying to the prosecutor that you know you can you can, you 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 not not only investigate the guilt of the defendant but you investigate the innocence. So you're doing both things. So it's look, obviously the court and the, and the drafters realized that they needed to have somebody who was neutral. It was a very interesting thing, and, it's, and it ended up being a very interesting passage because behind behind that idea and you know is the problem that the court inevitably has to face and it's dealing with an extremely contentious issues. So in a way that's very different from adjudication in individual crimes or individual acts of aggression, this court has to work with, um, the courtroom itself becomes kind of a microcosm of the, of the conflict. And in anticipation of that, they thought, well, and investigation as well. I mean, you know, you normally have police to protect the investigators and gathering of evidence. In this case, everybody is vulnerable. So um, what is intriguing about this is that it raises the question whether the court, here's my main idea, here's the main question, whether the court, in the way it operates, and the way, and its procedures for managing, cha managing the chamber and the trials, whether it is in fact appropriate for the unique um, cases it must adjudicate which are always manner, uh, crimes that are committed inside social aggression, not individual aggression. So that's been, that, was, that was sort of something that came to me and as part of this book, it came out as a kind of a, not the main idea, but one of the, one, one of the, one of the keys. A little bit of background. Um, 2002, the Security Council <clears throat> struck a committee which they called the Panel of Experts on the Illegal Exploitation of Resources in the Congo. And it really was to look at um, the consequences for the Eastern Congo and the unrest there, which many of you know about, I do hope, between 2000, between the middle of the 1990s and 2000, um, that, uh, um, which lots and lots of people died. There was something called the Congo, the, the, the World War of, the, of Africa and stuff like that. And I'm going to give a little bit of the background because this trial is in that context. Um, in 1996, Kagame and Museveni decided to march on Kinshasa with their respective troops and depose Mobutu. They did it, and they took in, they had in tow the infamous Le Père, Laurent Kabila. And Laurent Kabila was, was supposed to be Kagame's puppet, his man in the Congo. But after a couple of years, it became very obvious, even though Kagame, I will not go deeply into Kagame and his character, though I know something about it, but he's a tough guy, a very, very, very tough guy. And um, Kabila was not doing what he told him, so his puppet didn't work out. So he decided to march, march again. 
And, and in two, 1998, him and, and Museveni reassembled the UPDF, reassembled the RPF, these two armies, and marched on Kinshasa, and this time it backfired. Because instead of obeying, Kabila organized Zimbabwe and Angola on his side, and these are two tough countries, and he found, and, and to oppose the other three countries who were the other side of the war, Rwanda, Burundi, and Uganda. Well, the war went on, it killed five million people. I mean, it was outrageous what happened. Um, but, to call it, but to call it a war would be, I think, um, going a little too far. Because in fact, it was just a bunch of soldiers beating up on civilians um, and taking whatever minerals and whatever things of value they could get their hands on. And um, so this trial and the conflict comes about in the, in, in the legacy of this war. There's been a lot written on the war. It's very interesting. Um, I won't go any farther into that, except to say that in the, in, in the aftermath of the war, all of the countries that had been involved, including Angola, Zimbabwe, they all stayed. Their soldiers stayed. Their leaders maintained an interest. And in particular, I want to talk about two of them. Kaga First of all, Kagame. He stayed in North, in North Kivu and South Kivu and the eastern side of the Congo, and he took everything that he could get his hands on. In fact, he even established a Congo desk inside his defense department to process all the profits that he'd gotten that he used to buy more weapons and to uh, stay in power. It was a scandal. Um, Museveni did something very different. He didn't really seem to care like Kagame did to make a huge thumb. I mean, he, he got his buddies, he got his son-in-law, Salim Saleh, he got Otafiri, his friends, all of them went in there and started uh, making alliances between the UPDF and different ethnic groups, like he would ally with the Hema and then the Nande and these different groups, and he created this atmosphere of tension between all of them in order to provide a cover for his, for his own fashion of extracting minerals, extracting all kinds of things. And now let me just make a personal note. I was on the committee, and I was assigned to Ituri. So over this period of time, it happened to be in this very time that the Bongo was coming to power, I observed it. Um, I observed the way in which min min minerals were, were, were evacuated. I observed the way in which, Kagam, in which um, Museveni operated and UPDF and so on. <clears throat> um, it was in the context of this that Lubanga made a deal with Museveni, and it was through his support that Lubanga was able to realize his massive ambitions. He was otherwise just a minor warlord. <clears throat> and, his, and his ambitions were saying, his idea was that he would make the Hema, or he would assert that the Hema were the only originaire of the area, that anybody who was not a Hema or an originaire had no right to property. Anybody who objected, he'd kill them. And he had this, and, and, he, and there became this massively xenophobic uh, movement. It was, for me, horrific to observe. <clears throat> they called him Mr. Al-Qaeda of Ituri. <laughs> it was so bad. Museveni eventually became ashamed of him, but it continued and continued and continued. And between 2002 and 2003, something like 15 months, with his militia and with the support of the Ugandans, he went on a rampage that killed over 10,000 people, raped women, despoiled people of their property, and uh, was really something to behold. And for me personally, um, I don't want to go into it too much, but, but there were a couple of very, very unpleasant and traumatic moments. I give this background <clears throat> because I think it's important not so much to, <laughs> and I don't mean to do this, to establish my authority on the matter, because, of course, I only saw a piece of it any more than anybody else did. Um, it's what made me write the book. Because the, the, the events that I experienced were in some ways so upsetting and, and so difficult, and even the legacy of them were difficult, that I was compelled personally to, to follow the crimes. And then when Lubanga was taken and brought to trial, 
I couldn't stay away. Uh, at this juncture, I need to thank the School of Law because it was Valerie Oostevelt who's very active. She's the one who got me an introduction into the court. And I ended up being a professional in residence of the court, so I was able to follow this thing through. I also want to, you know, put this thing in that context because I'm going to make an assertion. The trial was egregiously inadequate. The trial was, I mean, a failure. And part of the, and, and what the book is about and what I'm going to talk a little bit about is why it was a failure and what I think some of the consequences might, might be. <clears throat> and you can see aspects of this same failure in all of the five defendants from the Congo who've been brought before the court. You know, Gojolo, Jermaine Katanga, Bemba, which is a very different story, but now our, our very own friend, Bosco Naganda. Um, let me say <clears throat> right off the bat that I'm not the only one to make this assertion. For those of you who follow international law, Bill Shabas is a name you probably know. Even Bill Shabas, a very conservative legal commentator, an academic of some extraordinary repute, even Bill Shabas called the trial a nightmare. In, 19, in 2011, the New York Times had a comment that said, you know, <coughs> this trial is going, is coming apart. It's going down the tubes. And it was. And one of the reasons for, for this is that um, first of all, it was the first trial. Spotlight was on. There were legal luminaries. There was Luis Moreno Campo, our wonderful friend, the prosecutor. He was certainly a character. He has not been very well treated after his departure from being the prosecutor, but I happen to think that he was quite, a, quite an extraordinary character. There was uh, the judge, the infamous Lord Fulford, uh, truly an English lord and a very bizarre man. And there was the defense counselor, Maître Mabi, Maître, I mean French for lawyer, Maître Mabi, who um, was one of the most, has been, was one of the most extraordinary courtroom lawyers. Now these guys really got into it. And I think that one of the interesting reasons why it became such, <laughs> let me just say that I just gave a thank you to Valerie for introducing <laughs> me to the court. <laughs> Your timing, my dear, is absolutely impeccable. <laughs> very dramatic. Very, very, very dramatic entrance. And I'm talking about, and, and, and one of the things that struck me, and I think struck everybody, um, was, well, let me give it just a, a very, very brief picture. The judge and Moreno Campo, there could not be two more different people. It's just impossible. And they loathed each other. They truly hated each other. And it became very obvious in the course of the trial. Maître Mabille, whom I have to confess I have a particular fondness for because I met her many times. I went to her cabinet in Paris and I spent some time with her because it was very curious what she was doing. But she took it to the extremes. She used this uh, enmity between the judge and the prosecutor to push um, some of the most outlandish ideas upon the chamber that had absolutely no justification whatsoever. So the courtroom became, and I'm saying this euphemistically, became truly a microcosm, you know, of the conflict. <clears throat> now, my as 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 as, as things went on, my uh, supposition. I kept trying to explain this to myself, because here was this. I mean, I I adore the court. I mean, I went there because I. And a great spot. Here was this thing just falling apart. I, I have, the, let me just, I have the idea that the common law tradition in which that, that, that kind of drives the court, it's not the entire, it's not the only thing. I mean, there are both the accusational and the inquisitional aspects of the court, and everybody talks about, if you read the literature, people talk about the two kind of, not really. The adversarial method of inquiry prevailed. And it was that that fueled this thing. And um, in particular fueled it because the court is dealing with crimes that are not individual acts, but social acts. And I am of the conviction that social acts of aggression have a very particular character. Let me say a couple of reasons why. First of all, an individual acts of aggression 
or in crimes, individual crimes, domestic trials, you don't see too many victims. Maybe one, two, maybe a dozen on the outside. But in these crimes, there are thousands, absolutely, literally thousands. And the number of people that are involved are thousands. It's very public. Secondly, one of the things that's very unique about it is that in trials, in many trials that I've looked at, individual crimes and local and domestic trials, you know, there's a discovery process. And you have cops, investigators, and in different countries it's of a different, it's different types, but investigators go and look, try to find out what, you know, what really happened. Because that usually happens in private. I mean, you're not going to kill somebody in public, unless you're very bold, but you're certainly not going to rape somebody in public. So, I mean, so these, you have to get down to the bottom of it. You don't have to do this in these, in these cases. It's in the public record. And something that most people don't realize is that there are lots of people writing about the trial, me included. Can I you was stop you there in the public record in what sense? In the sense, let me tell you, in the sense that um, NGOs like Human Rights Watch, I see. NGOs like International Crisis Group, They've NGOs like Oxfam, they all have people on site. Right. Care, save, all I of them, right. have, and they're all writing reports. There's the United Nations. By the time, by the time Lubanga was really going at his thing, um, there was. Uh, MONUSCO had come to be thousands of people with, you know, three or four public, child protection officers and human rights officers, and they were all writing reports. Which is curious. This is in addition to the press, this is in addition to people filming the thing and, you know, to all the splash in the media that this took. What was always curious to me was that the, many of the judges and the appeals judges in particular who operate in the court are very suspicious of these external sources of information. They want to rely on the investigators that are related to the court itself. But in fact, these investigators were not very good. I knew them. They were old policemen of various sorts. But, most, but, but the two or three of them who actually did operate, they were okay. They went and did, did what they could. And, and they got, are you trying to open the door there? <clears throat> Oh, closed door. Sorry, am I, ta am I not talking a lot? Can you hear me? It's okay? All right. Um, and this is what I'm talking about. I mean, the, 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 so there wasn't just one or two. or There were hundreds and hundreds. And I also want to say one more thing. That the reports by the Human Rights Watch or by Amnesty International, those guys, they're impeccable. They're absolutely impeccable. They get down to the bottom of the cases. They know exactly what happens. They know who gets murdered and by whom and what and, 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 and how they were murdered and the responsibility of, the, of, of Lubanga and so on. So that's a very interesting thing. So, if, if, so there isn't anything really to find out um, more than what is already known and what is in the public record. And to then push the issue into or, or continue the investigations through some adversarial process where you question everything, it just doesn't work because it tends to confound rather than clarify the process. And then let me come back to a very interesting third point, which is that really, I mean, it's very contentious anyway. You don't need to add to the contentiousness in a, in a, in a trial like this. And the same thing was true of in Gojolo. You don't need to add to the contentiousness of the chamber and I'm talking about the chamber itself, the interactions in the chamber, um, because it's already there in spades. Um, and I think, in a way, I think that's why, and, and certainly Valerie can maybe bring some more, more light to this because she was there, but the, the, the drafters of the Rome Statute must have had a sense of this, certainly more than I did before I began, of course, but, but a sense of it because Article 54, where I started, coming back to it, did make this provision that there needs to be somebody, some neutral process, some combination of common and continental law, if you want to call it that, or civil law, some combination, some juge d'instruction who will take a neutral view. Otherwise, you're running into trouble. And they also knew, I think, and I, we, we, I think this is on the board yes. somewhere up there. And there at the bottom somewhere, there's, I mean, you can see some very interesting things. Because knowing that that would be exceptionally difficult, they also gave the prosecutor some very unusual and special powers. 
And those powers included, in particular, making deals with international organizations like Amnesty International, like the United Nations, and so on. And not only that, but the deals could include a commitment by the court that the sources could be kept confidential. It should, and in principle, ought to have worked. But it didn't. It backfired. Because even before the trial started, this was in 2009 uh, or 2010, even before the trial started, this ferocious and extraordinary Maître Mabi, have I said that Maître Mabi had defended Paul Bisingamani in, 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 the, in, in the Rwanda trials, the guy who, where the, this, um, you remember that there was a town called Jikoro, I think, and, and, and there were a thousand people assembled in a church. It was a very famous incident. And he implored everybody, all the members of the, all the members of the town to go in and even provided machetes for some of them to go in and they killed all 1,000 people who were in, or approximately 1,000 people in the, who were holed up in the church. I mean, she defended him and really got a pretty light sentence for him. And I must say that she's quite a character. Anyway, um, she claimed that this provision in the Rome Statute was, was improper. And instead of promoting collaboration, which it was meant to do, it became a source of division. And she and her uh, um, sidekick, uh, Bijou Duval, stood up in the court and demanded that it was unfair and the court and, and the trial should be terminated. Uh, that was extraordinary in its own right, but what was even more extraordinary was that Lord Fulford agreed. And three days before the trial, he declared a stay. So now, Lubanga is free to go, go back to Ituri. The trial is over, and everything is adjourned. Of course, it went to appeal. But the appeal lasted for 10 long months. And during this time, enmities increased, investigations got more intense, and things like that. And by the time the trial really started, as I said before, the case, the, the chamber, was truly a mess. And, and so it, it occurred to me that this was, really an, that this was really something which just wasn't working. And the trial, I was there from time to time. I was in the gallery and, you know, <clears throat> and they were all in, in the spotlight. I was on all this trial all the time. Even Angelina Jolie showed up for a couple of occasions. I'm sure her people were involved in this. And uh, so you can imagine that these, the legal luminaries were really out to make themselves known. Well, um, I uh, then, what I want to just say a couple of words, I, I witnessed this thing over a period of two and a half years. Um, the bickering, the grandstanding, the legal theatrics, which were sometimes just like fireworks, people hollering at each other and and and, and things like that, and, poor, and and Judge Fulford demanding that his authority be respected, and it was really quite bizarre. I want to just give one thing before I sum up what I what I've said, and maybe we can raise some peripheral issues. Let me give you an example. Um, there was uh, the prosecution among the 60 and some witnesses who'd been brought before the trial, had been brought to the chamber. 13 of them were witnesses that had been brought in by the prosecution who had been child soldiers. And you know this, that was the key, that was the key, the key and only charge, it was recruitment of child soldiers. So these guys had been child soldiers. They were now 20 years old some of them, still very young. They were brought in and um, <clears throat> put on the stand. And you can only imagine what this must have been for these guys. I mean, these guys had just been flown in from Kisangani, maybe, maybe Bunya. And they appear in this megalith of an institution and lily white, everything is perfectly clean and, and, you know, and, 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 and uh, impeccable. And they're, they're sitting and, uh, and, and, and across, them, across from them is the old 
commander of the army, whom they are, whom they are supposed to testify against. It was very bizarre. These, these, let me say, these guys, who, these witnesses, had been chosen very carefully, really, by Moreno Campo, and I had to take my hat off to him. I had to take my hat off to Moreno Campo on many occasions. He, he really is an extraordinary character. But this is something he'd done very carefully. And he had made sure that most of these characters who'd been brought in were, brought, were, were ones who had fought in the wars but who had then experienced traumatic circumstances and as a result of their trauma had given in their weapons and run and, and, and escaped to join the transit centers, there were three of them that had been set up to take care of kids like this who had been fighting and who had terrible experiences. That's how they found out about most of these guys. So they, they, were, they were really not bad witnesses because Many of them and their parents had been killed, they had no place to go, but they had been in and they had done everything they could to make sure that these guys could speak well and so on. Maître Mabille cross-examined them with a vengeance, made demands on them that they simply could not meet, broke them down on, on two or three very interesting occasions, which I was quite, extra, it was, I was quite astonished to, to witness, and then claimed that none of these 13 witnesses had been child soldiers. None of them. That none of them had had anything to do with the war, that none of them had ever fought, and that they were all involved in a conspiracy with the prosecution and the prosecution's associates to lie and to, and, and to lie about them being child soldiers. And she made this claim over and over and over again. And what is so extraordinary is that the judge accepted it. Based on what corroborative evidence did the judge accept it? He accepted it on the basis of inconsistencies in the testimony. Now, the inconsistencies were, were, were provoked largely by the cross-examination of Maître Mabi. And Maître Mabi knew exactly what she was doing. Um, now, let me say that a, that a year or so later, after, after the end of the after the end of the of the uh, of the fighting, um, I happened to be involved in a survey that looked at um, how many child soldiers belonged to each of the different groups in the Turi. <clears throat> I wasn't the head of it, but I helped and and was an advisor to the survey. So we counted them, and I can tell you with some authority that there were we counted at least 3,200 child soldiers who had been fighting at that time who had been fighting for Lubanga, and who were still in his army in 2004. This was essentially two or a year and a half after the fighting was over. So there must have been at least 5,000 of them, and all of them you could see, I mean, there was no, it, it was so unlikely that, and that there, there, weren't, there are not many Hema. So it was so unlikely that of the 13 that had been carefully screened, given so many child soldiers who had been involved, that these 13, none of them, had participated in the fighting. You know, w one of the things that uh, struck me is absolutely extraordinary was how the permissive adversarial approach to investigations and to the conduct of the trial, how that had stifled the accumulation of, what was, of, of, of any decent evidence. So in the end, the evidence for his, for his guilt was almost non-existent. It was, it was quite bizarre. In the end. What sense did you say it had been undermining its credibility? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, there, 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 the judge didn't accept the... But the, only ostensibly undermined, not concretely undermined. In the, chamber, the, the, in the chamber, I don't think there was any difference. In the, you're saying that there wasn't any real basis for for the impeachment of the credibility of these child soldiers. There wasn't any base for it. There were simply naked assertions N that nope. they weren't there. But it occurred because the judge simply declared that it was true. Okay, how do you explain that? I don't get that. I, don't ex I, don't, I do not understand it. And, 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 and uh, I, I, have, I have spoken and interviewed with all the people who were involved. It was very, well, I did what I could. Except one person would not speak to me, that was Lord Fulford. And, and, and because I was very curious about this. Um, 
why, how could he accept the defense counselor's claim when the evidence against that claim was so profound, so immensely profound? In the end, uh, because I was involved in, 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 in this, in this not so small group of people who were very interested in the trial. You know, we all kind of got into, and everybody thought he was going to, he was going to be acquitted because of the way the judge was proceeding. We were all very, in fact, I think the judge realized the first trial wouldn't look good. His record was, was going to, so he in fact did find him guilty in 2012, as you many, as most of you certainly know. So, but nobody made a big fuss. And then when the sentencing came and the sentencing brief, it really, I mean, instead of the, the, the maximum penalty was requested by the prosecution. In fact, they gave him half, and then you take away the amount of time that he'd been in prison. Lubanga is going to be out pretty soon. So it was an extremely light sentence, and it did absolutely nothing to, um, to militate against the impunity of guys like this. The trial was, I mean, I wonder, I wonder what the consequences of putting this in the book will be, but the trial was essentially useless. Um, let me give five areas where I think as a result of the contentiousness in the chamber and the failure of the investigations to establish, to be able to establish credibly some unimpeachable evidence, things would go woefully wrong. First of all, I think Moreno Campo realized at the beginning that this was going to be a tough situation. He knew Maître Mabi, he could see the situation building, so he asked for only one charge. In fact, there were, he had done so many things that almost every one of the crimes that, have, that are listed in the Rome Statute were, were, were committed, but there was only one. Secondly, any attempt to recharacterize the charges were blocked by the judge. I've never figured out why. <clears throat> and, in, and, and in some cases, because there were two associate judge, both of them opposed Judge Fulford, but Judge Fulford pressured them and recruited Maître Mabi and forced the appeal chamber to overturn any, and there were two or three of them, any attempts to recharacterize the charges. In particular, remember, we probably, I haven't said this yet, but remember that many of the victims, and we know the victims are a critical part of the ICC trials, any of those were women who had been raped. The, the one charge really didn't have anything to do with their circumstance and their participation in the trial. And not only that, but when it came to questions of compensation, if that's all that was going on in the trial and that's all he was convicted of, they would never receive compensation. So their presence in the trial was useless. Made no sense whatsoever. So it was really a big issue to recharacterize the charges. And in fact, the victims themselves made an attempt, made a special attempt, submitted a petition, and it was overturned by the judge, and eventually by the, by the appeals court. That, I think, was a grievous problem. Thirdly, um, because the recharacterization of the, of the charges never occurred, there was only one charge which governed all the discourse in the trial, and it had nothing to do with sexual violence. But sexual violence was absolutely key to what went on in a Turi. Absolutely central. These guys were wanton rapists, wanton. And uh, most of, many of Lubanga's men, I knew it, I, could, I observed it. And we observed women who had been, who had been, and they heard it in the trial. But at some point, he embargoed any discussion allowing sexual violence. There was a very, very interesting associate judge, Elizabeth Benito, and, um, from Costa Rica, very intelligent woman, and she said, look, even if you're gonna have one charge, within that one charge, you know, within the recruitment charge, you can, you can include a consideration of sexual violence. The judge embargoed it. Um, it was a tragedy, that, that's number three. Number four, the victims were never given any place in the trial. There was just too much going on. I mean, the, 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 the claims and counterclaims going this way and that way were so intense that if the, when the victims tried to intervene, they would always be shut up by the judge. Even though they were wonderfully represented, it just never, it just never materialized. And so one of the consequences was that you never really heard 
from the victims as you're supposed to when it comes to these ICC trials. And one of the interesting consequences was when the judge finished his, when the judge wrote his compensation brief at the end of the trial, which is absolutely critical to the conclusion of the trial, still hasn't been done, but when he wrote his brief, he very definitely excused Lubanga from any obligation to the victims. It went to appeal. Appeal overturned the, uh, overturned the claim. But still, the very idea that the judge would just exonerate Lubanga from all obligation to the victims. So there are many things that went wrong in the trial. I come back to this, and I'm going to conclude with, with this. I mean, I have I have come to the understanding. I think, and I, I you know, I'm I, I spent lots of time trying to make sure to see if this is relevant. But I think that there's a very important point here. I do not think the try. I do not think the criminal court, the ICC, it has not so far been a, had a mechanism for dealing with crimes of social aggression. They're very particular. Now, I don't want to get into an argument about inquisitional approaches, with, with, with continental approaches to, to, uh, to trials, but I do believe that the trial, the, the court, really requires a major reform. And, a ma and, and by major reform, I mean there needs to be some neutral investigation process and not the prosecutor, because the prosecutor, by definition, is already engaged. But something that partakes of, and that is independent of, and that can deal with this material that's already in the public record, that clarifies it and synthesizes it in objective fashion, that does not, at the same time, confound it and undermine it, as the Lubanga trial did. Done. Thank you very much.